Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Binance Podcast. My name is Wee Zhou. I'm the host for this show. In my daytime job, I'm the Chief Financial Officer for Binance Group. For those who don't know, Binance is a blockchain company and operates one of the biggest cryptocurrency exchanges in the world. In addition to the exchanges we operate around the world, we're also helping to build a bigger blockchain ecosystem with other key initiatives and investments, including Binance Labs, Blockchain Charity Foundation, Binance Info and Academy, as well as Trust Wallet and Travel by Day. For me, I joined Binance from the traditional financial world, where I previously served as the Chief Financial Officer for several Chinese and American companies. Two of them have been listed on NASDAQ and NYSE. I started off my career in investment banking at Goldman. And my personal background, for those who don't know, I was born in China, but I grew up in the U.S., where I did my undergraduate education at Harvard. After graduation, I pretty much moved around uh, Asia and the U.S., between Hong Kong, Beijing, Los Angeles, and Singapore. Since I've joined Binance, I've basically witnessed a lot more people who are becoming more interested in blockchain and cryptocurrency as a whole. And the interest comes not just from, you know, buying Bitcoin or whatever, but actually people who are looking to um, make changes within their respective industries. So what I want to do for this show is to spend time to talk to specialists, entrepreneurs, scholars, influencers, basically people from a variety of backgrounds. One of the first guests I talked to is Helen High, and she came from social development and uh, charitable giving background. I also plan to spend time with people from politics, entertainment, sports, gaming, advertising, just a variety of backgrounds and talk to them also about blockchain technology. Hopefully through these conversations, we can share insights on how blockchain is changing their industries, but at the same time, is also changing the world and hopefully making it a better place. All opinions expressed by our hosts and guests on this show are merely their own opinions and do not imply any endorsement or opinions of their companies. You should not take these opinions as investment advice as you will be solely responsible for your own investments. Today, we're really honored to have Leslie, Leslie Tam, who's the head of Binance's uh, OTC Solutions Desk. I'm here to basically to talk to Leslie a little bit about his background in finance. Leslie started off his career as an investment banker, as a lot of uh, as a lot of people sort of I think in our industry and in a lot of other industries you know come from or one of the one of the main sectors. And then finance, traditional finance, investment banking, is uh, a space that has been dominant in terms of finance. And in terms of um, you know the next stages of development for cryptocurrency finance and traditional financial institutions will play a key role in it. And Leslie historically has been a trader uh, as well as a salesperson uh, within uh, fixed income. And then he's uh, c- collectively has spent over 15 years at uh, Merrill Lynch, um, BAML, uh, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, uh, Deutsche Bank, and Goldman. Since uh, Binance has kicked off our OTC trading, uh, Leslie has been playing an integral part in terms of trying to bridge that gap between uh, cryptocurrencies and uh, traditional finance. Leslie, why don't you, you know, before we jumped into sort of like the real conversation, which is stable coins, which I think is actually uh, a key conversational topic, uh, not just in the crypto world, but I think in the traditional finance world now. Why don't you talk, give them a little bit of background about yourself, um, where, you know, where you're from, career wise, and then, uh, you know, and then uh, we we'll, we'll just go from there. Sure. Thanks for having me, Wei. Uh, so, hi guys, my name is Leslie. Uh, I grew up in Hong Kong, which is a uh, one of the financial centers in Asia. And uh, I think we have an ethos of uh, uh, being very flexible and being very aggressive uh, when it comes to trying out uh, new things. Uh, I, I grew up in Hong Kong, went to college in the States, and I worked for four years in uh, New York. So I was at uh, Deutsche and Goldman doing you know, program trading and equities and also on some structured products. So, uh, you know, when you when you read the book, The Big Short, so I, I was working at, at that time. <laughs> And uh, and then uh, I did sent, you work with fabulous Fab? Yeah, he sat behind me. Oh, Am I allowed to say this? <laughs> so so uh, yes, yeah, so I was in that I was in that team. Then I was was in Merrill for eleven years in uh, on the fixed income side. You know, and mainly in sales. But uh, what's very interesting is I actually see quite a number of parallels between between uh, what you may think of very different things, which is cryptocurrency. And uh, so you were in New York during the financial crisis in 2007, 2008. Right when it was happening. Mm-hmm. So I left New York in 07. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
And how, what was that like? The trading and the uh, and the fixed income and I guess the credit default swaps and all that stuff. Yeah, and I think in a way it's it's uh, reflective of of the industry in crypto right now because a lot of new products were being created and we were thinking of new ways to, and, you, and you felt like there was a lot of uh, innovation um, similar to crypto right now. Um, you know, but of course, what happened is the, the financial the financial crisis and uh, uh, products became a lot more vanilla and uh, and sort of that's I mean that's well what was happened what happened was was leverage was debt right, right? Basically. it was basically lending out money to people that can't pay you back and lending it on a global massive scale and right. selling those investment products right it wasn't necessarily the, the technology behind it mm -hmm. it was just how aggressive some people were were selling it without and selling leverage without the underlying investors understanding it mm -hmm. or, the, or the homeowners mm -hmm. and uh how did you like when did you first learn about i guess not even binance but i guess bitcoin cryptocurrencies in general so we first read about it in 2012 2013 and uh, a bunch of us were looking at it uh, back then i think uh bitcoin was around 1200 mm -hmm. and we thought hey why don't we why don't we just buy it it's a home run opportunity so we bought a bit uh, then right after that it dropped to 600 <laughs> And uh, some of our friends are saying, "Oh, we should we should just cut our losses and just sell it." I'm like, "No, we're, if we're in this, we're in this for the for the long haul. You, you don't sell at fifty percent. You know who knows? We could regret it. You could go ten times. Mm -hmm. You know." And then we, I'll be honest, we forgot about it for three or four years. Then the run up in 2017, uh, it it, it <laughs> ten thousand, and that and that peaked our interest, of course, mm -hmm. uh, in the asset class again. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what what sort of like you know in your Banking friend circle, what is their view of, I would say, your move? I mean, it must be pretty, I mean, because it looks pretty good on the outside, but once you're in, man, it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, a, a lot of people, uh, you know, uh, in banking, it's a pretty well-developed industry and very large asset class and a lot of, a lot of flow. Uh, it's quite comfortable there. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, a lot of guys are pretty shocked when they decide to leave the crypto. There was, you know, it's a lot of risk. I mean, CZ has said before, people take... People take pay cuts to to come to this firm, and which which is one hundred percent true. Yeah, I can tell you that is completely true. <laughs> but it's for the dream because uh, I I think the platform at Binance is great. I created on Binance, and I feel is a is a is a world class platform and and very easy to use, and uh, they seem pointed in the right direction, and that's sort of how it started. And what what do you see? I think one of the key things that I really want to talk about is basically. What are some of the links? I think, right? I guess I think you hear it's an exchange, uh, you know, tokenization of assets, tokenization of things that already exist, I think, in the traditional financial world as a way in terms of growing the digital asset as an asset class as a whole. I think that's sort of the big trend that um, pretty much a lot of people that come into the space are betting on, right? Including ourselves. But I think before I sort of get there, before you put the cart in front of the horse, sort of like, there are a lot of really cool things that's actually happening in our world today, right? I think the last few years is basically we're seeing initially the, the rise of the utility token. But I think one of the really unique growth opportunities, especially in the current bear markets, is actually the use of stable coins. You know, just for marketing purposes, Binance currently lists, you know, all of the sort of major US dollar based stable coins, USDT, QSD, USDC. Uh, also PAX and USDS. I think those are the ones that are currently listed on Binance. And I think if we go to CDesk, from my knowledge, you guys trade pretty much in and out all of them. Yes. But I think there's a couple of um, big news that hit sort of the wires the last few months. The biggest one being that JP Morgan is looking to print their own token on their own blockchain, right? And then Facebook is also rumored to be working on a Facebook token. And then at the same time, IBM is, um, you know, it's printed that they're going to help about six or seven financial institutions to basically issue that token. And I think, you know, before the, these US dollar stable coins were something that is only known to people that trade cryptocurrency. But with now basically seeing the word stable coin being more pervasive in the traditional media and also within the traditional finance circle. So I want to dive, I want to do a deep dive here with you just about sort of what is the JP Morgan coin? Because I think some of the words that are being used out there is basically is being used for internal settlement, interbanking settlement. What does that right. mean? Because I think you obviously have worked in a bank and you've seen how the settlement process and the coin process works. It's like, what is that? Can you explain what is settlement? Sure, sure. Uh, if you don't mind, we'd like to step back a little bit first to, to stable coins because I feel like it's a very important 
a tool for, for mass adoption. Uh, I think a lot of us in the traditional finance world, when we first look at this, we see the volatility of Bitcoin and Ethereum and some of these other coins, and we think there's no way we can base an economy off this, at least for now. Uh, and I think stable coins are a great segue into from you know the traditional world of, of money into tokens and, and cryptocurrencies. What's important here is that uh, uh, the space has actually changed a lot in the past six months. Back in the day when people wanted to buy uh, crypto using a uh, Bitcoin using fiat, they would go to one of the exchanges that they know and and, and put up some money. It's kind of a painful process. You have to do a lot of KYC. Then there's fees and they change all the time. And there's a lot of uncertainties waiting for wire transfers and and you're sending to bank accounts when you tie out with the name of the exchange. Uh, but I think stable coins have created a, a much easier and simpler buying opportunity if you understand it. So before, if you go to an exchange, uh, if you want to buy Bitcoin, you would you would wire money to the exchange, open an account, then somehow, some way, it would accept you. But they're not really involved and very experienced in fiat, so sometimes the customer service is slow. And then once you're once you're on there, somehow the monies are there's more fees being taken away. You don't know why. Then you buy Bitcoin, and then when you move it around, there's withdrawal fees and so on. And finally, when you want to cash out a little bit you realize that there's a 1% withdrawal fee back in the day. To buy crypto is basically you go to one of the stable coins and you uh, wire money to them, right? They're very well, you know, you can read about them. You know, there's a lot of guys like TUSD, USDC, PAX. They all have, uh, you know, they're backed by trusts and, and they're regulated. You know, everyone's different, but, can, but things have changed a lot. So uh, now an easy way to, and there's no price risk when you wire the money because it's one US dollar to one dollar stable coin. Mm -hmm. And uh, once you do that, you move it onto an exchange like Binance with low fees. And uh, you can trade with very little friction, with no costs that are, that are prohibitive. And when you really want to withdraw your money back into USD, sell your coin on Binance back into stablecoin, move it back to your stablecoin account, and send it back to you. There's no 1% withdrawal fees anymore. So in fact, it's uh, become a much easier way to trade. And, and uh, it's funny because uh, I'm new to the space. There are a lot of crypto OGs. People talk about stablecoin, but when we actually ask them, have you actually tried to convert a US dollar into stablecoin? Many of them actually still go back to the exchanges that, that they trust and, and know. And uh, I think there's a lot of room to grow there in terms of- I'll ask you a really dumb question. Right now, why is it only US dollar stable coins? Why is there no euros? Why are there no other current, like why are there no Swiss francs or, or Japanese yen? Like well, what's going on there? Sure, I think there's a variety of different factors. The main thing is that US dollar is the, is the preferred, is the most liquid currency out there for trading Bitcoin. There's some concerns about the interest rates. Uh, the U.S. interest rates are above zero, <laughs> so that that helps creating a stable coin. Uh, if you have a stable so as, coin, as yours, a holder of the coin, I don't get paid interest. You don't get paid interest, but for the company to survive. So the the printing agent, the company that sells issuer. the token, the issuer of the tokens, then collects a revenue on the in, from interest with the money in the bank account that it sits in. Right. I think most business models are are collecting interest there. Before you think it's a massive pile of money, mm -hmm. it needs to be fully redeemable. So. Uh, the interest rates are not that high, you know, but uh, it still allows companies to survive. Mm. Uh, but in euro, uh, some bank accounts now are negative rates. So if yeah. you put your money in a bank, you, you lose they euros. They charge you money, yeah. Right. So uh, that's why euro stable coin is, has found it tough and the other low interest rate interest countries rate like, like yen. But the other reason is just the, the cost and infrastructure of creating these, these stable coins. Uh, why create a yen stable coin when, frankly, the market's not big enough. You could, if you have yen right now, you just you should just convert to US dollars. And then buy a US dollar stable coin. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the cost is economies of scale not there yet to handle the other currencies. But the space moves very quickly, so mm -hmm. uh, I'd expect to see I mean, because stable coins in other countries. The list of banks that came out with the IBM article—they're all international banks, right? right. From right. different regions. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So so I expect more of the adoption. And and back to the discussion about JPM stable coin. Yeah. Stepping back, I think this is a it's a paradigm shift. It's I think what JP Morgan wants to do is they want to establish themselves as the the go-to platform for money transactions. Uh, you know, they don't need to use the blockchain or use a use a variant of the Ethereum blockchain. They could have their own systems. But what having what that does is it increases adoption. It, it gets a lot of passionate enthusiasts involved, and uh, I think it could it could be a game changer for the economy. It will take time, but I think it's a game changer. So why do I think it's it's important? So for example, right now. If you're working at a trade company and you want to wire money to your client, mm -hmm. you would have to log in to your bank website, use their uh, programs and formats. And if you ask for a customized service, you'd have to call them and they'd come back to you within days. It, it could take a long time, right? Uh, what I think is the or platform- Or you still have to 
sign a form and uh, fax it to them. Right, right. right. I mean, they, you have to go through that. Yeah. Maybe they're busy doing something else at that point in time. I think what's powerful about the blockchain is, say you're a company and you want to do these transactions. If you know, and, and if you see the, the payment system on the blockchain, you can create your own software that can access the blockchain. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, of course, there's ways to keep it private and you just need a key, but instead of having to use JP Morgan's or another bank's format and getting a report on it, wiring the money and waiting for someone over there to confirm that the tr SWIFT transfer has been made, you could just integrate the whole thing in your system because it's a public ledger that you can access. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess it's it's a global ledger that you can access. It's not necessarily public in that other people can see what you're doing, but it's it's globally accessible. And you can almost, you can write a program that does it. And uh, instead of asking JP Morgan to give you a, a ledger uh, for your audit purposes in a specific format, you can write your own program that just pulls out your transactions on the blockchain and create a and customized that's a global for commercial like finance, a global commercial trading company, right? Like right, like, right. Like that's commerce. That's traditional right. commerce. I can imagine these companies would have a team of people just managing the different banks on this on this type of transaction. Uh, and you can put, there's probably cost savings if you just hire a team of developers and you, and you write a program that does 80% of what it does rather than doing this grunt work every day. Well, what's so specific about, I mean, theoretically you can do that with stable coins now, right? Like mm -hmm. I can in country or location a, or I can just send you stable coin, right? right? Instead of send, going through the traditional financial network. And sending you from bank to bank wires, right? No, I think that that can work. I right. think JP Morgan is just trying to preempt this before it gets bigger. So, so I think for JP Morgan, because I think they are one of the biggest, I would say, clearance banks for the U.S. dollar, right? right. For the fiat form of the dollar, right? They're probably one of the the dominant banks for that. So, and for them right now, they're basically creating their own network, right? Of a U.S. dollar stablecoin, right? Essentially. Yeah, I think, I think they see the value of the stablecoin and they want to preempt. Why are the stablecoins right now still not well accepted by the outside general world? I think generally it's, it's concerns about uh, KYC, AML and other regulations. And uh, I think what JP Morgan is saying is I create a closed system within myself where I've already done KYC and AML. So, it's my all for, so, so this JPM coin is all for existing JPM clients only then. That's, 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 that's what it sounds I mean, it's private. I can see that's what they want to do. Mm -hmm. uh, so they you know, they can make the regulators happy because they say all of this is within my closed system. I've, I've KYC every single person in here and uh, I can track all the transactions. And so uh, in that sense, uh, unlike the other stable coins, I think in the near future, the JPM coin would not be tradable on exchanges such as Binance. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about like, what is it like, we'll go back to my first question. Like, what is settlement? What does that mean? Yes, yeah, settlements is basically the wiring of money. So, for example, if you buy equities, they have T plus two settlement, mm -hmm. where you buy the equities, but but you know they have to put your money into a global system, settlement system. So, in uh, for bonds, we have Euroclear, and you'd have to hire that company to wire your money. They're the global clearance system, and for various reasons, which no one, well, if even for me in my in my fifteen years of banking, we really know it takes a very long time to settle, and uh, I think it's just part of it is just legacy. You know, or, or there's a system that, you know, and Euroclear is not incentivized to kind of open it up for, <laughs> for everyone else to deal with this. So I think with blockchain, this is a much easier way of transferring cash and actually tracking it. I think many people have had the frustrations of, uh, has the money really hit? And you spend an hour just calling the different banks, confirming if or, the money has or, really hit or certain day, accounts. Or days. <laughs> right, right. And so uh, a lot of it could be quite complex. You'd have to, uh, maybe other guys have custodians. So I have to wire money to the custodian who then wires money to Euroclear, who then faces the other side there's five guys in the middle and each time it's almost a manual process where you have to call someone in between to check whether the money's been hit uh with blockchain it, it should be a lot simpler it's kind of silly because it's not the most elegant solution but it's it's probably the most effective solution uh, that exists i mean the most elegant solution could arguably be a very very streamlined very well-tuned settlements company that can do this in, in half a second mm -hmm. but uh i think it, you never well that maybe that. maybe that's what jpm wants to get to right because i know when i send things or what is it? when i send stable coins right it's about couple, five seconds mm -hmm. 10 seconds in right. terms of like depends on how busy because i know the existing stable coins are all on the erc20 most yeah of most of them are erc20 so ERC right? definitely i mean we have I mean, at Binance, we're a little bit concerned about security, certain attacks. So, so we wait for a, a number of confirmations mm -hmm. before it happens. But uh, effectively, it's in your account it's in, really in five minutes. Or five less. minutes, right? Yeah. It's, it's pretty quick. Yeah. yeah. And I think that could potentially 
that process could potentially be a settlement solution or a replacement of the traditional settlement process. Just another example. Uh, I was giving the example of buying Bitcoin using US dollars. Mm. The part that takes the longest time is for me to send my money from my bank account in whatever country I'm in to the stablecoin bank. Mm -hmm. That's the process that's slow. Once I have the coins, to move it around is very, that's very easy. easy. So uh, if basically if my bank, wherever I live, is in JP Morgan and the stablecoin bank is also JP Morgan, then and that is also blockchainized, then that process could take half an hour. That transfer of value is a lot faster, would, would be a lot faster and create a better experience. Right. So then, so irregardless of whether JP Morgan opens it up. So if you are a customer and you use their coin, it could, it will improve your experience, right? Whether you're a retail client of theirs or an institute. Yeah. I think retail, you can track and you, you feel like it, you feel things are in your control, mm -hmm. uh, which is definitely not the case right now when you're sending money through Swift around the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the other case is you can custom, you can customize it because you have, you have the, the, the code it's, it's there. Mm -hmm. You can, you can write, as long as you have the keys, you can, you can write your own systems to deal with it. And, and, and following, I think following that news, you see FOMO taking over and that uh, Citibank's announcing that they might be doing their own calling and then they may not, may not do it. This is almost a tech play. I mean, you could see it's sort of like, it's sort of like WeChat in China or Facebook. You know, if you have the platform, everyone uses it. Uh, you get an effect where everyone just comes in. So uh, there could be a lot of trading companies and they realize that doing this with JP Morgan is much more efficient than doing the traditional way with the other banks. And then they move their accounts over to JP Morgan. I'm sure that's what JP Morgan wants to, wants to achieve with mm -hmm. this, with this coin. So, uh, who knows? Maybe down the line, people can sign on to their to their network. But but I would say they definitely want to yeah, leverage but, the critical mass. Yes, yeah, like that. the thing is, is that that's only I don't know. I mean, that's only maybe five percent, ten percent of the financial world that sits within that ecosystem. But then the rest of the world, there are many other banks. Who knows? I mean, I, I, we don't know their strategy, but maybe they could have partner banks in other regions, and then JP gets their flow as well. So so uh, I think it's it's an, it's an aggregator effect where the where the largest where the largest Counterparty probably gets gets most of the flows, and yeah. Goldman can do their own coin. Yeah, well, I think they're they're focused on the Apple credit card right now. So. And just or sort of come come back a little bit in in terms of um what you are currently doing specifically, other than I guess you know trading Bitcoin and trading stablecoin, is go go back to sort of like tell 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 me a little bit about what you've been working on at Binance and what kind of solutions you've been adding. Sure, this. I had a Binance OTC, which is over the counter. Uh, I think of it as sort of an extension of finance. So, so uh, yeah, I'm not I'm not really a, a crypto OG in that sense, but I'm here to I'm here to uh, achieve our, our motto, which is exchange the world. And by exchange the world, I don't mean just Bitcoin. I mean all the other tokens out there as well, and the ones that are listed on Binance. Uh, so I think of it as a as a way to provide liquidity for all the different coins that are traded mm -hmm. uh, on our exchange. Uh, so you know, over the counter, most people think of of fiat buying into buying using fiat to to buy Bitcoin. Uh, we think of it a little broader. It's just it's just all trading, and so uh, as as Binance.com is a, is a crypto the crypto exchange unless unless you use credit cards and uh, outside of the of the fiat exchanges and fiat on ramps, um, most of our trading is, is is coin to coin, and in fact uh, the experience is 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 quite good because you don't need to wait for the fiat part that normally takes a day or two to to settle. So uh, you know that's what we're trying to build, and and uh, that's what we're trying to tell the world that uh, OTC is not just Bitcoin into into USD. Uh, in fact, uh, you should maybe you could even use stablecoin as your base, and we will convert. We can easily uh, trade into into and out of stablecoin, and you can go back to your stablecoin issue and convert it into cash. And, and, and what kind of um, what kind of who are your who are your customers? Who are your clients right now? Sure, I mean, I mean, uh, we trade on the Binance Exchange as our as our platform. So I would say we have a very broad and a deep set of set, set of clients. Uh, we have uh, guys who bought Bitcoin from a, from a long time ago. Uh, we have some of the most sophisticated algorithmic funds in the world, and we also have the projects uh, and also uh, you know so called whales that that are private customers who have who have a lot. So of so you size. basically offer off exchange solutions to people that want to move tokens, essentially. That's right. So for example, if you want to move say five hundred thousand or two hundred thousand US dollars of a liquid token. Uh, the way to, there's a couple of ways to do this. One is you go on Binance and you, and you click, but because of the of the lack of liquidity, you could click for six hours and, and still not and still not sell. And in that time, who knows how much crypto can move in six hours, right? The other way is you write your own algorithm to 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 trade it using the APIs, but that requires some level of sophistication. Uh, and so what we're here to do is we can give you a price uh, that locks in the current market level. Well, it does, there's a little spread, but but uh, it locks in the current market level. So one, you save your time. 
Two, uh, the market doesn't see it, so uh, it moves in response. So if you're trying to sell uh, two hundred thousand of a of a of an altcoin, uh, and and you start selling it in the market, people could preempt your your selling, think you're got you got bigger size behind it, and sell in front of you. Uh, so when you when you trade it with with us on OTC, it's off exchange. It doesn't show up on the exchange. Uh, another benefit or non benefit, but I call it a benefit, is it doesn't show up on the blockchain either. So mm -hmm. uh, as it's as it's within the the, the Binance ecosystem, uh, it's just within the same same wallet. Uh, I see. I see. Yes. Yeah, so some so it does provide a certain level of uh, you can hide trades essentially. Yeah, I mean some people it. What at the exact point where you trade with Binance OTC, uh, nothing can be seen. Uh, but you know, some people are concerned with moving your coins to Binance. They think they think people can preempt you on selling. Mm -hmm. And to that, I say, just move your coins one day beforehand. <laughs> and, and and the guys that are preempting you, you know, they can do it for a day, but they don't they don't really have much to work with. Yeah. Okay, great. All right, thank great. thank you, thank you. Thanks, Thanks for your time. Lot. Looking to, looking forward to uh, chat next time. Yeah, sure. So b before I end today, I want to spend a little bit of time um, discussing what Leslie and I had discussed um, just now about the JPM coin, um, which has been covered by a, a research report that was written by uh, Binance Research on, and it was released on March 1st, 2019. And, and some of the key takeaways from that report is actually very interesting, not necessarily in terms of within the cryptocurrency space, where stable coins has been a stable product for the last um, four, to, four, four to five years since the inception of the Tether in 2014. I think mainly because JP Morgan as an institution, or at least from the CEO Jamie Dimon perspective, you know, has been quoted numerous times calling um, Bitcoin a fraud. Um, but at the same time, they it seems as though that JP Morgan has been the most aggressive financial institution hiring and building up their blockchain expertise. Um, first of all, when it was uh, extensively cover that they're building a uh, quorum which is a uh, private and permission version of ethereum right so so some of the key like two or three key takeaways from the binance research report was that one the jpm coin i think does have potential to materially impact um the traditional financial services market right with really with regards to institutional clients use cases such as like clearing and settlement which is um, what we had discussed earlier but we don't see it as potential to displace the current liquid and publicly traded stablecoin in the near term, given its private permission structure. I think that's sort of the first key takeaway. And the second key takeaway is actually sort of a potential competition between the JPM coin and the ecosystem, I think, um, that the Ripple ecosystem, which are currently existing and then focusing on different aspects of traditional finance. But I think, you know, another key take, the second key takeaway is that we, we see actually minimal direct competition between the two in the near term, um, mainly due to the closed nature of the um, of the JPM network. Um, however, so sort of the third key takeaway is actually, I think, the more interesting one, which is that should the JPM project proven to be a successful model, um, that's actually going to drive more adoption um, by other institutions um, for private blockchain. Right, and and this is actually extremely interesting because um, the way our research department, our Binance Research viewed it, is that this could be a very interesting immediate stepping stone for you know larger crypto mass adoption towards actually more um, public distributed ledgers. Right, um, so so this is really really the, the interesting part. But because instead of having one decentralized you know various global ledger, you're going to have a series of um, private distributed ledgers backed by you know various enterprises. So um, so I think that is probably the third takeaway is the more interesting um, point to watch, which is a potential competition of some sorts between private distributed ledgers and the public distributed ledgers that we've seen and in, uh, in the in the existing industry. So speaking of um, private ledgers, there's another thing that that recently had come out that I want to spend a little bit of time cover in terms of what we know and what we don't know. With, with regards to the Facebook coin. So, you know, about a month ago, there was a New York Times article basically saying that Facebook has been working and developing potentially as early as the first half of this year, potentially at the F8 conference, announcing a Facebook coin. I think a lot of the details are unknown at this stage, but based on just sort of, I would say, publicly disclosed information um, that we've, we've gathered to sort of 
you know, the variety of uh, media sources, we can sort of grasp of what we do know about it. First of all, I think um, Facebook historically in the early days have actually had a um, credit system, right? If you remember um, people who play the Zynga games, there was actually a payment system like the original Zynga Farmville games that ran on the Facebook desktop games. So they had historically had a internal credit system, an internal payment system that worked in fiat. So theoretically, we could see the same type of ecosystem. However, I think one of the key things is, is that from, I would say, you know, 2000, mid 2012, 2013 to today, is that there is a new ecosystem that kind of exists. First of all, now we have a, a payment system now that can operate outside the scope of the mobile app store, which uh, outside of the Apple App Store and also the Google Play Store. I think that's one key sort of development in, in the sort of the bigger industry. Then the second one is actually the use of use of the traditional stablecoin that we've discussed. I think one of the things that we've heard is that you know, the Facebook coin is going to be pegged to a variety of local currencies. And I think what this means is that Facebook has potentially will have their own system that could um, run micropayments for nearly zero cost, uh, which is we've already seen in the existing stablecoin markets. And, and the third one is actually the existence of blockchain technology, right? For example, the ERC-20 uh, blockchain, which many of the existing stable coins has already been issued on, that's something that they could use um, potentially for Facebook. Uh, and, and I think that provides a track and lock system for all of the transactions that go on there. And and I think um, at least whether they're going to do cross-border, uh, we don't know. But what we do know that within a country, so sort of the P2P transfer is actually very, very interesting because then it will allow Facebook as a whole to engage with their, you know, games and app developers that's already in their existing system. And I think that's something that's really, really interesting. And that's not just for Facebook, but for example, for WhatsApp. Like we have heard that Zuckerberg, Mark Zuckerberg said that they're going to thinking about rolling out payments on WhatsApp in some of the countries. So whether they use the Facebook coin for that, I think that's something that is really, really interesting. Some of the questions that we hope to get answers from actually goes back to sort of the same discussions that we've had um, with regards to JP Morgan, which is like, the coin. Will they use a public or private blockchain? I think that's one of the key questions. And just sort of like what are going to be the assets? What are some of the currencies or the that's going to be that this coin is going to be pegged against? Whether these coins are going to be listed and how are they managing the compliance process of it? And then is it going to be single use within the Facebook ecosystem? Or are they going to be able to open it up? Because I do know that Facebook has a very, at least historically, you know, they have a very big open API policy, right? Which is like, can they open this coin use case up to other agents and other companies? So I think all of this are things that we could answer because once if it's open, then you run through a whole gamut of potentials, right? In terms of merchant payments, global remittance, you know, P2P payments, all of these things are possible. But if even if it's just within their own ecosystem, then basically, you know, it would solve a lot of their internal sort of um, token economic issues in terms of the creators and the viewers, right? In terms of the content creators, the game developers that could come back to the Facebook ecosystem. So, so I think all of that as a whole is what we're seeing in the marketplace. And it creates a dynamic that we probably haven't seen before. At least a lot of these traditional institutions um, on the internet side, on the financial side, um, using blockchain technology, and more specifically, applying sort of the, the stablecoin um, use case within their own ecosystem, and basically using that as a way to engage with their consumers and engage with their users. So that's something that we look forward to, to getting more progress from. And, and as a whole, you know, I think all of this speaks to the oncoming adoption of cryptocurrency. Thank you for listening to our show today. Again, I would like to thank our guest, uh, Leslie Tam, who uh, is the head of OTC at Binance, uh, to join us today to talk about his experience in the uh, traditional finance or industry, as well as his views and opinions um, with regards to stable coins. Um, for me, uh, my name is Wei, Wei Zhou. I'm the Chief Financial Officer for Binance. We hope to bring more exciting shows and bring more exciting guests for you in the future. If you've enjoyed the show so far, please help us to retweet it, to share it. And most of importantly, subscribe the show on uh, Apple Podcast or wherever you get your podcast. Uh, hope to see you again soon.